sound that saved a wretch like me. Anyone feeling like a wretch this morning? No? <laughs> Actually, wretch means unhappy or unfortunate. So if you come into church feeling unhappy or unfortunate, you may do. I don't know. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I can see. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. Yeah. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace. It's what we've just been singing. Wow. I don't know, but when you know God like that, he is irresistible. If only people knew what he was really like. If only people knew. You know, so much in our modern world is, is so throwaway. It's so temporary. It doesn't last. But I love that we're still singing songs like Amazing Grace, which have been around for 240 years, that song, by the way. And we're still singing it. And the truths are as solid and as relevant for us today as they were all those years ago. You know, I want to tell you this morning that God is still in the business of revealing who he really is, even in our cynical world. And he's still bringing people to an understanding of saving faith. Amazing grace. It's the air that you and I can breathe to counter out the toxic environment we often find ourselves in. So over the next couple of weeks here at church, we're going to be looking at amazing grace. We're going to be exploring what it is, how we cultivate an environment where grace reigns and how we live in the light of that amazing grace. It could be life transforming. I don't say that lightly. And today is a great day to start this on our reunion Sunday because, you know, the backstory to Holiday Club, if you weren't aware, was it's all about what happened beyond the wardrobe in the land of Narnia. And within that world, there is such a great illustration of amazing grace that I want to talk about briefly this morning. So the Chronicles of Narnia, has everybody heard of them? Surely, the seven books. You might not know all of the books, but you would have read or watched The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe at least. Anybody not and has no understanding of what that is? Oh, good, good. We're all on the same page. I don't have to explain too much. So <laughs> it's all about four children, Peter, Susan, anyone remember? Edmund and Lucy. And they find themselves transported into a completely different world, the world of Narnia. And it's living under a curse, a curse where it is always winter and never... You do know it. And that's why our decoration for the Holiday Club this year was all winter-themed by the way. But can you imagine how unrelenting that is for it to be always winter? I can't cope when it's winter for a few months. But when it's always winter, never Christmas, you've got nothing to look forward to. It's a good description, actually, of what life is like for lots of people in this world today. Nothing to live for, nothing to look forward to, especially nothing to look forward to when this life is over. No hope. It can all feel meaningless. It can feel pointless. No light at the end of the tunnel. You know, the characteristic of winter is, it is the absence, really, of sunlight. It's when our position as the earth is orientated away from the sun. It's the coldest season with the harshest weather conditions. <laughs> it was that. <laughs> You're not looking forward to winter, Helen. It's coming. But Christmas is coming too, that's the good news. <laughs> many, of us, many of us can relate to that in times, in times in our lives when all has felt cold and all has felt dark and we can't see an answer to the questions we've got. We can't see a way ahead. I don't know, maybe that's a description of how you've come to church feeling this morning. In the Bible, there's a letter written to a church in a place called Ephesus and it sums it up like this. It says, you were living in this world without hope and without God, and you were far from God. 
I don't know if there can be any worse description about life than those two words, without hope. Without hope. And notice they're coupled with the words, without God. It's when you live without him that you can so often end up without hope. And there are so many people living in this world today who feel far away from God. They can't see him. They can't hear him. They don't even believe in him. Well, I think you'll agree that if you look around the world, it really does showcase what life is like when it is lived without God in many ways. You don't have to look too far to see the depravity and the despair of a, of a life turned away from him. Cursed, literally. Always winter and never Christmas. Well, in this story, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Edmund makes some pretty dumb decisions. <laughs> I think you'll agree. Mostly out of feeling hurt by his older brother. Let's not forget that. And he chooses to believe the lies of the enemy, the white witch. Betraying his brothers and sisters. Enticed by promises of rooms full of Turkish delight. Is that anybody's temptation? No. (laughs) Promises that he will be made king over his brother and sisters. Never mind that he'd already heard a prophecy where he would rule as king of Narnia with his siblings. But he wanted to be more important. He wanted to show them that he knew better. So he ran away to the castle of the White Witch. And by the time he realizes he has been deceived, it is too late. And he's held captive. And he's condemned to die. That's the situation he finds himself in. And before you start judging Edmund, by the way, I've got to say that he is just a picture of what mankind is like. You know, God has promised that we will reign with him. And he invites us into a relationship with him that's beyond anything we can imagine, bringing meaning to our existence and hope for a future, both now and to come. And yet, And yet mankind was enticed by the empty promises of of wisdom and and, and pleasure. And we thought we knew best. We wanted to be like God. We wanted to do things our way without him. Some of us still do. But the consequence of that was that we found ourselves in this cursed world. Held captive, literally. Literally with the only certain thing in life being death. It's the one thing you know is going to happen to you when you're born, is that you're going to die. And the Bible calls that state lost. Lost. If you have no real sense of God with you and no understanding of who he is, then you are lost. It's the state that we're born into. The Bible issues this damning verdict on mankind in Romans chapter 1. It says they traded the truth about God for a lie. It's a a lie. And it's tragic that this world is in the state that it's in. With wars and violence and addiction and heartbreak. None of us escape it. But just like young Edmund, we left the path that we were destined to follow. And we ended up lost. We ended up separated from our true heavenly family. Without God and without hope. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's paths to follow our own. I mean, the Bible is pretty accurate, (laughs) don't you think? But how can we undo that wrong? How can we return? How can we escape this captivity that we we find ourselves in, well, the devastating reality is that we can't. No matter how much medication or money you can get your hands on, there is nothing that we can do to find our way out. Nothing to secure our release. Nothing to secure our future. It doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't matter how hard we try. We just don't have it within ourselves. Death demands its payment in the end. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? 
<laughs> it gets better. It gets better. It wasn't the end of the story for Edmund at that point. And it is not the end of the story for us. Yay! You know, at Holiday Club this year, one of the team, Jake, he was held captive by the beavers. And his friends wanted to save him. They wanted to know what to do to secure his release. Here's what they were told. Have a listen to this. You'll be pleased to know the children surpassed their 100 sticks. And Jake is alive and well. Uh, the, point, <laughs> the point is that a ransom demand was made on his life. Jake could not pay it himself. He was held captive, remember. So someone had to pay it on his behalf. Hold on to that thought. In the story of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Edmund is rescued, but the white witch demands her legal rights. Because according to the deep magic that was written on the stone table and put into Narnia by the emperor at the very beginning of time, every traitor belonged to her. And she was entitled to a kill. She knew her rights. Payment still needed to be made. And so if you remember the story, Aslan, the lion, the true ruler of Narnia. He has a private conversation with the witch. And then he tells everybody that the matter is settled. She has renounced her claim on Edmund's blood. And it's only in the next chapter that you, you realize the bargain that Aslan has made, that he will die instead. That he will take Edmund's place. It's such... An illustration of God's amazing grace towards us. His saving grace. Edmund did not deserve anything. He made his choices. He went his own way, even if he did regret it in the end. But whether he liked it or not, he found himself captive, and he no longer had a choice. He had to take the consequences of his actions that is until Aslan stepped in and took his place. Now, he didn't have to do anything, Aslan. He didn't owe Edmund anything. But in order for Edmund to be truly reconciled to his true position and, and restored to his rightful place, it was the only way, and he chose it. And this is what God has done for us. This is what the song Amazing Grace is all about. That God's riches, God's rightness, God's redemption at Christ's expense spells out grace, G-R-A-C-E. A little acrostic for you there. <laughs> God's riches, God's righteousness, God's redemption at Christ's expense. We do not deserve anything from God. And yet out of his great love for us and out of his incredible mercy towards us, he showed his grace by paying what we couldn't pay.
He paid the ransom by taking our place and giving up his perfect life. That's what Jesus did. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. It says that he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Is that the God you've heard about before? That's the God I want you to encounter today. And he is not wagging a disapproving finger at you and me, waiting to strike us down for anything wrong that we might do. That's an impression that a lot of people have about God. He's like this old man in the sky with his lightning bolt ready to get you. That's not the God of the Bible. Yes, he is all-knowing. He already knows what you and me are like. He knows what we've done. He knows what we're doing. He knows what we're going to (laughs) do. And yet in his great love, he he came for us. He sees the state that we're in. He sees that you are lost. But rather than condemn you, he chose to come and find you. And he chose to come and save you. Let me read to you some verses from John chapter 3. These are some of the most famous verses in the Bible, but this is from the message version. And it says, this is how much God loved the world. And the world is you and me, by the way. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. You know, every one of us is living under that curse, that always winter, never Christmas. This world is cursed. And whether we realize it or not, that's the lost state that we're in. But God did not leave us helpless and hopeless. He sent his son, he sent Jesus into the world. And Jesus said, this was his mission. He said that he had come to seek and to save the lost. And that's us. He was willing to pay the ransom demand on our lives. In fact, he was that ransom demand. He was that ransom payment. Here's a verse I want to leave you with. It says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he's been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you've come to trust in God and you've placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. I don't know if you remember the end of the story in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but Aslan, he goes to his death and he's killed in Edmund's place. And then he comes back to life. Do you remember that bit? He says, this is Aslan's words, he says that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still which, we, which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time, but if she could have looked back a little further, she would have known that when a willing victim who has committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, that the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. You know, C.S. Lewis's story was, it was just an analogy of a far greater event that has happened in human history. Because when Jesus gave up his perfect life in our place, he not only paid the ransom demand on our lives in full, but he he smashed the power of death. That's why it could not hold him. That's why on the third day, he came back to life too. That's why he can be trusted, because he completed what he said he had come to do. He demonstrates in the most tangible way to us how much God loves us and how much God values us, how much he believes in us. And all he asks is that we believe in him and that we trust him. 
It's just far more than just a thought in your head. It's far more than just a philosophy of your life. It's far more than, this is not religion we're talking about here. It's a real relationship with a God who is alive. It's like being set free from prison when you come to know him. Set free. And none of us can add anything to what Jesus has already done. We can't earn it, and we can never repay it. Romans 5 verse 6 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. A gift. Some people find it really difficult to accept a gift. I've known people accept gifts and then not open them. (laughs) That's crazy, isn't it? I've known people like Jan who open them before she even gets them. (laughs) Sometimes when they're hidden under the tree. Uh, (laughs) But the very nature of a gift is that it is freely given and it's yours. It's not on loan. It's not a bribe. It's, It's a gift for you to enjoy. So can I encourage you with God's gift just to accept it and be thankful for it? Don't worry about not being deserving enough. None of us are. Don't set your thoughts on what you're going to have to do to repay it. You'll never be able to do it. Just accept it. Just accept him. Open it. Celebrate it. Enjoy it. That's what the Christian life is really all about. It's about enjoying real life. It's living out the freedom that Jesus has bought for us, isn't it? Growing in relationship with God, our Savior. Looking forward to all that he has planned ahead for us. So let's stand together. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch, not just like me, but like you. I once was lost, but now I'm found. was blind, but now I see. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Let's sing it together.